Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. I went RV camping with my friends back in high school. We hiked way out into the woods or mountains and collapsed exhausted into our RV. Middle of the night, I hear something outside my RV. Then another something and another all around the RV. It sounded so much to me like something stalking up to our RV surrounding it. I gathered my courage and looked out, shining my flashlight in up the pitch black darkness. All I could see in the dark was shining eyes looking back at me. Not little eyes or eyes close to the ground, but almost man height and large. It wasn't a particularly frightening experience, but it was undeniably bizarre. Out of the blue, my brother, our roommate, and I decided to embark on an RV camping adventure. As we peacefully slumbered in our tents, our dreams were abruptly shattered by the chaotic noise of a man, clearly high out of his mind, stumbling and bellowing incoherently. Startled, my brother and I were instantly jolted awake. The cacophony intensified as the disoriented individual approached our tent. Without hesitation, my brother, seizing the moment, armed himself with a pistol. In a stern but calm voice, he declared, We're sleeping. Go away. In response, there was an eerie pause. The unsettling silence was quickly disrupted by the distant wailing of police sirens. A few tense minutes later, law enforcement arrived on the scene instructing the erratic intruder to drop whatever pole. Like object, he held. Suddenly, the night air crackled with the unmistakable sound of tasers, followed by the thud of the man hitting the ground. The next morning, my brother, our roommate, and I shared a hearty chuckle about the peculiar events of the previous night. So the first experience happened when I was seven, eight years old, and we lived in a suburb called Molden in Darwin, Northern Territory. There were these aboriginals that lived up the road from us, and they were notorious for having a lot of domestic violence and always having cop-slash-ambulances over their house. What happens when the families fight is that they start doing black magic on each other and sending evil spirits-slash-curses to each other. One night, the cats and the dogs in the neighborhood were extremely vocal. The dogs couldn't stop barking, and the cats were meowing and running from drain to drain, trying to find somewhere to hide. This went on for a good four hours until about 12 to 1 a.m. Me and my mom were sleeping, and my sister came running in the house saying, Get up there as an alien ship outside. We get up and go outside, and fair enough, there is something that's silver-colored and shaped like a typical saucer, as you see in the movies right above the aboriginal's house. It had lights underneath it projecting onto the ground, going in circles. They were a light blue color, and from the outside going into the center. It was biggest to smallest, and they were circular shaped. The lights just kept twirling around, and I wish I took a video, but back then, phones weren't very common, and... Even if you did have a good phone, the camera quality was terrible in the early 2000s. It stayed there for a very long time and then left. The next day we heard of kids that had followed it on their BMX bikes from different suburbs away. This wasn't the only time it happened. It happened at least twice, and every single time it would start off with the dogs and the cats in the neighborhood going crazy. I know it wasn't a fake prop because of the animals and at least seven to ten other witnesses that seen it. I seen a video on YouTube of cats sensing earthquakes before they hit because they have supersonic hearing and I have also heard that before a natural catastrophe like a flood happens. Animals will seek high ground the day before it happens. They know things that we don't for sure. The second weird thing that I seen was when we had made a trip to Alice Springs. My sister was dating one of the boys that were from that house and that family. 
when we were in Alice Springs late at night, we happened to see another weird thing which very closely resembles the old PS2 startup screen with the colored balls twirling around each other. There was four lights, colored orange, green, blue, and red, just twirling around each other in a pattern maybe 12 feet in the air. It was so strange for it to be so prominent and just stay there for a long time doing it and allowing us to see it. My sister told me 15 years later that the reason the lights were following us was because her boyfriend had a curse on him. He was an accessory to murder. He had given one of his relatives an axe to go and kill his wife and the lights had followed us. 1500 KS all the way from Darwin. The third time was at my property in Berry Springs, maybe 25x out of Darwin. A lot of people started telling us that they see lights on our property, and it's a rural property with lots of land because I'm a traditional owner. We thought it was thieves trying to come on our property with flashlights and steal stuff while we were sleeping. I was around 11 to 12 years old when I saw the light for myself. It was late at night again, and I was going down to the stairs because the toilet in the house was broken, and I had to use the outside toilet. About 30 m away underneath a mango tree, I see a faint light like an old torch when it loses its battery and it starts to turn brown. I was about to yell out because I thought I was about to catch the thief, but very quickly I realized that it was gliding and sort of bobbing up and down. And maybe it noticed that I saw it so the light went from a dim brown color to an immaculate gold color. I can't even describe the color, but it was like a small piece of the sun right in front of me at night. It's like when you see a lightning strike at night, and it lights up the entire area around it. Well, I saw it in a small compact ball the size of a basketball. There is no man-made thing in this world that could match the brightness that I saw that night. It was incredibly bright. It opened my brain up to a whole new brightness that I've never seen in my life. It was kind of like a human spirit because it turned the corner as if it was walking. It didn't go through the wall. It was nearby and it stayed on the footpath. I would have stayed and stared at it, heading into the opposite direction. But as soon as I seen it turn the corner, I immediately thought that it could easily turn back around and come charging straight at me. I got incredibly scared and ran back up the stairs, and what made it worse was I was home alone and I couldn't go outside and pee. There's a common name for these lights called Men Men Lights, but I'm not sure if that's what I seen that night because I've heard of people seeing the lights that were either green or red, but this one was a strange type of golden that I've never seen on this earth. The fourth time was when my uncle was dating and aboriginal woman and she had a niece whom my sister befriended there are these things called hairy men they are ugly little creatures that can pop into the spiritual realm and our realm kids are given these creatures as protectors apparently and they can hop into the owner's body and help them fight my sister and her friend that lived with us was stupid enough to accept one of these creatures as a friend and that's when a lot of crazy things started happening in the house. For example, as we were taking showers, we would hear little giggles and knocks on the door. My mom would fall asleep on the lounge and wake up in a whole different spot at the front door. There was lots of other things that happened that I can't remember because this was at least 13 years ago. We were eating dinner one night and for some reason they loved coming out and tormenting us when it was a stormy night and raining heavily. Well, I happened to see one of its faces just peeking up from under the table, looking at our food. I got a very quick glimpse of it. It had pale skin, a scar on its face going from top to bottom and black hair that was very thin and horse-like. Immediately got up and screamed and threw the ashtray at it, but it disappeared. We left the house that night in our food, and the next day all of our plates had no food on it. We had to go into town and find some aboriginal men that knew how to get rid of these things through black magic. They came to the house and was doing all kinds of chants and rituals, and we even heard it in a bush nearby and one of the guys threw a rock at it, and it made a dull thumping sound, as if it hit flesh. 
And that was the last we ever had any more paranormal experiences from them. When they were in our house before the men came, I experienced my fourth paranormal encounter. We all started sleeping together in the lounge room because we were too scared to sleep alone for obvious reasons. I was the only one awake, and I couldn't help but feel there was a presence in the house. I stayed up for maybe four hours looking around the room because I felt like it could pop up out of nowhere, and I would easily see it. Well, it didn't show itself to me that night, but... What it did do is start slamming the cupboard doors violently at least six times. I literally didn't hear any footsteps in the house that night, but it was just on the other side of the wall slamming the cupboards really hard, like it was angry and that was the most frightening experience of my life, because I was the only person experiencing this. It's true that your fear feeds evil entities because I was scared that night and was really focusing on it, giving it my energy. And it was really hard to go to sleep that night knowing that this thing had physical strength. But I did end up going sleep that night out of pure exhaustion of staying up really late. All in all, these experiences have helped me build my faith in becoming a Christian man because I know for sure that demons exist. I ventured into the vast wilderness of Alaska, embarking on a solo hunting expedition in pursuit of stags. The dense forests promised both challenge and opportunity, their secluded depths holding the potential for a prized catch. With every step I took, the sunlight above grew dimmer until finally I found myself enveloped in an eerie twilight beneath a towering canopy. As I ventured deeper into the woods, an uncanny sensation tingled at the back of my neck, urging me to be on high alert. I followed the winding path, my senses sharpened by the absence of sunlight. And then there it was, a figure emerging from the shadows, an enigma shrouded in darkness. The creature loomed before me, its large silhouette contrasting sharply against the subdued forest backdrop. It stood upright walking with an unsettling grace that defied the norms of the animal kingdom. My heart raced as I instinctively sought shelter behind a nearby tree, my breath caught in my throat. Peering cautiously from my hiding place, I saw the creature draw nearer, its dark form manifesting only a few feet away. It appeared black, slightly shorter than myself, and devoid of any discernible neck. No eyes met my gaze as if it were a creature stripped of the very essence of life. As the creature approached the tree, I cowered behind. It lifted its head, its nose raised to the air. It seemed to sniff as if detecting a scent that eluded me. My body froze in terror, rendering me incapable of even the slightest movement. I stood there, a statue in the presence of an enigma. Then, as abruptly as it arrived, the creature turned away walking casually and disappearing into the depths of the forest. Relief washed over me, but confusion and curiosity lingered in its wake. Who or what was this mysterious entity that defied the natural order of the world? Driven by both awe and trepidation, I raised my rifle, taking aim at the retreating figure. I pulled the trigger, the resounding crack splitting the air. The bullet struck the creature, but to my astonishment, it merely ricocheted off its impenetrable skin. It was as if the very essence of the creature repelled the force of my attack, leaving no trace of harm. As the creature vanished into the depths of the forest, a knot of bewilderment tightened within me. I pondered the implications of this encounter, grappling with the knowledge that there were realms beyond my comprehension. My mind swirled with questions. But when I returned home, my wife greeted me with anticipation, eager to hear of my hunt. Silence fell upon my lips as I wrestled with the unexplainable encounter I had experienced. No words could capture the profound impact that encounter had on me, and so I remained silent, preserving the enigma of that secluded forest within my own heart. In 2017, I was an undergrad living with three other students in a rough student house in a big city. For context on the layout of the house, this will be beneficial for the story. 
My bedroom was the only one on the ground floor beside the front door and opposite the kitchen. We only had a front door and front windows, no back door. My bed was in the middle of the room. The bottom of the bed was facing the bedroom door. There were three floors in total, two bedrooms on the second floor, and another bedroom and sitting room on the third floor. One June evening, we all decided to head out with a few other friends who came round for pre-drinks for a big drunken night out in town to simultaneously celebrate end of exams, my 21st birthday, and one big last hurrah before everyone went back home or went traveling for the summer. I'm not a huge clubber, so me and my then-boyfriend were ready to go home at around 11.30 a.m. We hitched an Uber back, drunkenly got a takeaway, and passed out in bed around 22.30 a.m., At 4.30 a.m., we were both jolted awake by one of my housemates slamming open the door. We've we've been robbed. We rubbed our eyes in bewilderment, as neither of us had woken up and thought she was playing some horrible prank. Surely, given our proximity to the front door, we would heard something. We walked up the stairs to discover the upstairs rooms were largely ransacked and items missing. Everyone's electricals that weren't on them were gone, like laptops, iPads, cameras. Passports were gone, and my housemate's weed stash was taken. A baseball cap from the girl whose room was on the third floor was found in another person's bedroom on the second floor, meaning the intruder wore the cap and took it off as he... They proceeded through the house. It then hit me. What about my room? I raced downstairs to check my belongings and discovered that my handbag at the bottom of the bed was missing, and my ex's phone and wallet that were also at the bottom of the bed was taken. My laptop was on the bedside table beside me and was untouched. The intruders managed to break open the front door, go through the entire house, ransack rooms looking for things to steal, and actually open the door of the bedroom. We were sleeping in to take things right in front of the bed we were in and we never woke up to any of it. To say I was shook when I found out what happened was an absolute understatement. The police came to take our statements and file a report, but nothing ever came of it. To this day, I am still super uneasy to go to bed in an empty house after that night. I am forever thankful that we never woke up in the middle of the robbery, or that I went home alone that night, because the outcome could have been very different. Myself and my two cousins were out hunting. I had met up with my younger cousin, and we both hiked up to an old logging road. We then heard a very loud scream come from across the valley. It was about a mile or so across, and the scream seemed so loud at first I thought that some lady was screaming for help or something. The screaming lasted for just a short time, maybe 30, 45 seconds or so. I asked my cousins what that sound was, and they said they have never heard it before, even though they have hunted these woods for about seven years now. I then remembered that I read in a book that Sasquatch sometimes make a loud screaming noise. I still do not know exactly what made that noise. So I started at college in September 2022. It was so great because I'm a little strange and realized I was around more people who liked art and were a little strange. It was nice at the start, but obviously a little awkward at times. There was a couple people I felt I clicked with straight away, and there were various people I would sometimes talk to in class. I was kind of finding a couple of these talks, especially with this one girl. She had an accent that would fluctuate between American, British, and kind of Swiss were in England. I don't know it was something that I would fixate on coups I have had. At first I figured she may have autism, but obviously I couldn't know before. Time went on and we started all talking together on a big table, which was all good until there were controversial topics coming up from the girl. Over time she would continue to share more unpopular opinions she had such as transgender people, her views on men as a whole, and many more things that in this day and age obviously became an extremely uncomfortable conversation. I was beginning to get really distracted by all of this, and was slipping behind and the deadline was soon. 
I decided to message this girl to just ask her if we could maybe stop the provocation of crazy debates. She took it kind of well. I'm not really sure she just said, okay, I get that. I felt really bad and tried to reassure her that she wasn't doing anything wrong, really, and it was just distracting me and my friends, and no one else was going to say it. I'm often quite forward and communicative in bad situations. She then messaged me about two weeks later, saying saying I was attacking her beliefs and how I've made her feel completely ostracized. After this, in school, we didn't talk, although she would come up to my friends and call them bestie and whatnot. It was really awkward. Then a group of three friends in my class told me she told one of them, who was trans themselves, that she wanted to know what it would be like to stab someone, and that she probably could if she got angry enough. I was pretty creeped out, and we started to see things on her social media suggesting she was immensely transphobic and was a radicalized feminist. We reported this to the college, and they said they would speak to her. The next week, she came up to me and sort of confronted me about reporting her calling me selfish and was laughing in my face. I told her I really just don't want to be surrounded with this much hate and that my classmates are beginning to feel unsafe around you, so I want you to leave. Hook, it was a little mean, but I got so mad. A couple of days later, she was regularly being pulled into meetings about the reports. On the Friday, she was called into a mediation meeting with the transgender people in the class, with teachers to settle the situation with communication. Right as she was pulled from the class, she walks up to me while I was sitting down doing my work and whispered in my ear, I will expose you, and walked out. I was genuinely disturbed at this point. Luckily, it was the end of term, and we had a week off for things to cool down. Once we were back, I found out she had been moved into a different class. Safe to say I was pretty excited about this, as what we were fighting for did something. They can't exactly kick her out, but still a gesture. Sorry if I'm getting off track. Things really did cool off for a while, and it was all good. This last week, I went into the other class as all resources are in that room, and we have a tiny computer room. She was in there, sat with my only friends in the other class. This was weird. She sat there and started crying when I came in. I left and came back a couple time because I needed stuff. You know how it is, and that was the end of it. Until yesterday. I thought the issue was dealt with finally, and she was balked on all socials, so she wasn't living in my mind at all. I got 14 voice messages from this girl saying her life is a mistake, then changing to she's right, and then she started threatening me. At this point, I started having a fully blown panic attack, the way she was speaking with anger and intent. She was acting like an evil villain or something. I listened to the remaining 11, and she started telling me to read the Scum Manifesto. I have no idea someone explained those. She then started saying she forgives all of us, but one girl that was friends with this girl's love interest. She ended it by saying she was never going to be listened to, and that she never thought I could do this to her, and that I stabbed her in the back by lying. I haven't been back to college today, and don't plan to. I think there are some serious issues going on here. I feel like she's a bomb waiting to go off. I just don't feel safe. What do you think, Reddit? I was living in Cook City for a summer, staying at a friend's parents' cabin with them. It's right by Yellowstone. My friend and I worked opposite shifts, so I hiked every day and most of the time by myself. Of the 40 or so hikes I did that summer, I rarely saw another person. The town has a population of maybe 200. I drove to one of my favorite spots and was about two miles in, and I saw a woman maybe a half mile down the trail from me. She was just standing there, and I assumed she was looking at the scenery. She didn't move at all until I was a few hundred yards from her, and she turned and was looking at me. She was dressed in far too warm of clothing for the day, but to each their own. When I was probably two hundred feet from her, she waved, and I waved back. As I got closer, I started to feel uneasy, so I sat down for a minute to decide if I should turn around and run from her or just get past her so I could get to my desired point on the trail. I decided I'd power past her. 
I got up to continue my hike and she was gone, just disappeared. This is the kind of trail where you can see clearly for most of the path and there is nowhere to disappear to. I decided to head back home and turn around and she was on the other side of the trial that I had just come from. I needed to get the hell out of there, so I started walking as fast as I could. She waved again and I didn't reciprocate this time. I put my head down and booked as quick as I could down the trail. When I got to where she should have been, she was gone. Again, I started running back to my car. The whole run back, and I'm not a runner. I felt like I was being watched. Got to the lot, and my car was the only one there, and someone had put a stack of rocks on my car. There were 13 of them, which is my favorite number. Small rocks. It was the creepiest thing I've ever encountered on a hike. After that day, I didn't make it through the rest of the summer. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched all the time. At work, when I was in bed, in my car, walking through the town. I left that weekend. It was hot that day, so maybe my mind was just playing tricks on me. Maybe one of the locals put the rocks on my car to play a prank on me. I don't spook easily. As a result, many... Many years later, I still don't like hiking by myself. Late to the game, but a couple of years ago, I was in my house alone, pregnant and with my puppy. My husband worked nights, so I was usually alone. I usually text him throughout the night, and I went to the bathroom and saw someone at the door trying to open it. Our front door had a glass design on it so you could see partially inside the house. I started walking towards the door because I thought it was my husband. I was in the hallway and noticed he was having trouble opening it, and my husband texted me. I said, are you not outside trying to open the door? He says, no, immediately I tell him someone is trying to break into the house. I called 911. The girl tells me to hang up and call the sheriff dept. At this time, the guy is trying to break down the door. I hid in a closet with my puppy in my arms. My husband works 15 minutes away and he got there before the sheriff. He was pretty scared and I was shaken up. Never again. We have knives galore. Our blue healer puppy is a straight up beast and we have an arsenal of guns, protection and hunting. I feel safe even with just my dog. Turns out the guy who was trying to break into my house was arrested for breaking into another house and sexually assaulting a minor. Grew up in the middle of nowhere. We used to have a smoke spot near an abandoned farmhouse about a half a mile out of town. It was a neat old house that you couldn't see from the road. It was surrounded on all sides by cornfields, and there were lots of trees to block the view. There was always a well-tended garden behind it. It had tomatoes, corn, peas, and that sort of stuff. We all assumed that it belonged to someone we knew or their relative who didn't have the space in town. One day, the fire department came and burned the house down to practice their firefighting skills. My friends and I gathered together later and started talking about it. We realized then that no one knew who the property belonged to and that no one knew who had the garden there. We went back the next day and there was no trace of the garden anymore. It was like it had never been there at all. We were all just there the week before and saw it. Now it was just overgrown weeds and bushes. The only thing that we recognized was an old metal white lawn chair that was always sitting upright near the end of the garden was still there. It was lying on its side, half buried in the dirt. We all agreed that no one would ever believe us, and I don't talk about it much. It still gives me the chills. My buddy was bear hunting a few years back, North Cascades along the Canadian border. They end up dropping into a valley 500 feet down and are getting into where the alpine meadows roll into the tree line. Probably only a half mile off trail, but nobody but a hunter would drop in down there in search of something. And not every hunter would do that. Most just glass from the trail. Anyway, they're hiking along and come across an open patch of sand in the meadow and they look down and here is this footprint. Not a boot print, a footprint. 
There was only one of them, and here used the real creepy part. He said it was small, like a child's. Got a real uneasy feeling after that. Now, there's plenty of drug trafficking and rumor of hidden pot fields up in these parts since you could hike stuff across the border. If you really wanted to, uh, I guess, have heard rumor of seeing teams of people that looked like they were out of place hiking these mountains. This area is only about three miles from the Canadian border, and it's a sea of wilderness on either side. The fact there was only one footprint and it was a child's bare foot makes you really wonder Okay, so uh, a friend of mine was telling me about glitches in reality on the way to the grocery store. We pull in and drive all the way up the parking ramp to level two, park directly in the center, then walk to the elevator. She presses the button to go down to the first floor, and we enter the grocery store. A week later, we come back to the same grocery store. We pull in and park. We walk to the elevator. I go in first this time and press the button. We go down to the first floor and enter the grocery store. When we're done shopping, we come out, take the elevator up to parking level two, and can't find my car. We look all over level two and start to kind of freak out, thinking my car had been stolen. So we go down to level one just to check, and my car is parked right by the grocery store entrance. Our memory of parking on level one rushes back. We both clearly remember getting on the elevator on level two. I'm the one who pressed the button this time, not her. But there was no possible way that could have happened if we had parked on level one. The only way to get from where we parked to the elevator would be to walk all the way up a long ramp meant for cars only and loop back and walk all the way across level two to the elevator. That didn't happen. It was the most surreal thing I've ever experienced and can only describe it as a glitch in reality. When I saw my car on level one after freaking out and not being able to find it, I clearly remembered parking there. We both did, but we had no memory of it until we saw the car. It was like the memory was edited from our minds and re-added when we saw the car. Our theory is that the realities overlapped, and when we shut the car doors, we were suddenly up where we had parked the week before. We both remember walking to the elevator from roughly the same area of level two that we had parked the previous week. Crazy man. I am not a super spiritual person, but it definitely made me realize that reality is not what we think it is. The first time I got up close to a black bear was about 15 or so years ago. Usually I'd hunt with my dad in eastern Washington, but he got into a bad motorcycle accident and was out of commission. That put me in a precarious position because he had a truck, but I only had Mustang. Thus I couldn't drive the logging roads into our usual areas. Using Google Maps, I located a juicy-looking tree farm that was about 30-40 minutes from Mount Rainier. It only allowed hikers, no vehicles, and required roughly 4.5 miles of hiking, with 2,000 plus foot of elevation gain, just to get to the first clear cut. Next one was seven miles in. I headed up there in mid-July with a gallon of water, some foil packs of tuna, an MRE, and a pup tent. Figured I'd stay three, five days and scout for bear and elk. The first mile was a brutal uphill trek but the last five were a cakewalk. Before I got to the second clear cut, I saw a well-established deer trail following the ridge and took it. It led me to a beautiful exposed ridge line populated with berry bushes and buckbrush that overlooked a giant lake. I decided to make my camp there right on the game trail in the overgrown clear cut. Right before dark, a thick, wet, misty fog rolled in, cutting visibility down to less than 100 feet. I got as cozy I could in the child-sized tent. The only way I could stretch out was if I laid diagonally. I put my rifle to the back of the tent and laid my .22 revolver and a flashlight on a yellow piece of felt by the entrance. I read for a while and eventually fell asleep. Sometime around 4 a.m., I woke up with my heart pounding. Initially, I couldn't figure out whether I woke from a bad dream or something else. 
Right as my heart started to slow down, I heard breathing and the sound of footsteps on wet wood. Before my fear got the best of me, I assured myself it was probably just a curious deer or elk since I'd had several late-night encounters like that before. I grabbed my flashlight and revolver, unzipped the tent, and stood up looking around. Much to my dismay, the misty fog had gotten worse and visibility was less than 30 feet with the flashlight. I was about to sit back down in the tent when my light picked up two yellow eyes roughly 60-80 feet to the left of me. The eyes bobbed down and then back up again, which reminded me of how deer behave when they're curious about something. I breathed a sigh of relief and said in a low voice, Piss off, deer. That's when the animal started walking towards me. The second I realized it was moving towards me, I knew it wasn't a deer. The eyes were only 18, 24 feet off the ground, and it was walking directly at me with no hesitation whatsoever. I yelled, Stop it and F off! The animal paused, giving me a moment to consider whether I should shoot the point twenty-two at it. I reasoned that it was most likely a bear, and that I didn't want to risk only wounding it and pissing it off. I decided to duck into the tent and grab my three-six. When I tried to pull it out, the rifle got caught in the tent poles and fabric. Like I said before, it was a pup tent designed for children. I was using it because it was super lightweight. When the rifle got snagged, I looked out and saw that the eyes were bouncing and could hear that the animal was moving towards me again, at a pace similar to a human jogging. I jumped back up and screamed at it, which brought it to a halt about 30, 40 feet away. Still scared of wasting the six rounds of point twenty two ammo, I grabbed a chunk of wet wood at my feet and lobbed it at the animal. The wood landed a few feet to its left, but it didn't react. I grabbed another chunk and lobbed it, this time striking the animal somewhere on its back. It ran about fifty feet to my right and disappeared. I kept scanning for a minute or so and then reached into the tent for my rifle again. Immediately I heard footsteps again, shot up onto my feet, just in time to see a juvenile black bear galloping towards me at about thirty feet. I screamed at it, pointed the revolver, and was about to shoot when it finally veered away and kept on running till it disappeared into the woods. I stood where I was, scanning around with the flashlight until the sun came up. Once it was fully light, I looked for tracks and found a couple paw prints and a fresh pile of scat. Both signs confirmed it was a juvenile in the 100,150-pound range. I loitered around till noon, trying to talk myself into continuing my trip, but my nerves were fried. I ended up hiking back out. Though I camped and hunted in that area several times afterwards, I never felt completely comfortable there again and always had difficulties with falling asleep. I never saw another bear there, only deer, elk, coyotes, and a skunk. I also never set up my tent on game trails again either. In retrospect, I should have just fired the revolver to scare it off. At the time, my brain wasn't functioning properly. I'd never been in a situation like that and didn't know how to handle it. Oh, well. In 2006, my wife's son and I decided to take a camping trip to Pinnacle Lake Trail in Washington. We were excited to spend some quality time together, enjoying the beauty of nature and exploring the rainforest. On a misty day with light rain, we set out for a hike. We hadn't gone far, probably less than a mile, when we came across a small trail that led to a boggy pond hidden within the lush forest. Tall trees draped with moss surrounded the dark water, creating an enchanting yet eerie atmosphere. Intrigued, we decided to venture further in. Navigating our way through the undergrowth, we carefully climbed over and ducked under fallen trees. The air felt heavy and oppressive, but we were captivated by the mysterious beauty of the place. Suddenly my wife stopped in her tracks and said, We need to leave. Now, confused, I asked her what was wrong. But she couldn't explain it. She just felt an overwhelming sense of unease, as if something bad was lurking nearby. Trusting her instincts, which had served us well in the past, I agreed to leave without hesitation.
We retraced our steps back to our campsite and spent a quiet evening together before packing up and heading home the following day. Upon arriving home, we were shocked to see a local news report about a double murder just two miles up the trail from where we had been hiking. Two women had been killed the day after we had been there. Chills ran down our spines as we contemplated the possibility that my wife's intuition might have saved us from a similar fate. Was there a connection between her sense of unease and the brutal crime that had taken place nearby? To this day, the case remains unsolved. We'll never know for certain if my wife's instinct sensed the presence of a killer or if it was just a coincidence. But one thing is clear. Trusting her intuition that day may have saved our lives. That experience has left an indelible mark on our family, serving as a reminder that sometimes our gut feelings are worth listening to, no matter how inexplicable they may seem. I live in a big woods in northwest Oregon, and this happened this year at my house. We can generally hear the ocean, trees, sounds from the street, and loads of wildlife, frogs, birds, insects, depending on season, and we have a rowdy neighborhood and general living noises. But one night it just all stopped. There was no sound at all on an un unusually clear night. It's cloudy a lot here in the Pacific Northwest. Well, I went outside. I wanted to see if I could find a UFO or something mysterious happening. I wanted to see if there were any sounds. Curious, but the rest of my family were like, Get inside. Shut the window blinds. This is mess. I give my apple cores to a couple of deer who live in the woods, Sandy and Sarah, and one of them came up. She seemed scared and felt better standing right up beside me in the oddest thing. I could hear her breathing. It was dead quiet, and there was this whoosh-whoosh of breath in and out of this nervous deer. My family dragged me inside about then. I still feed the deer apple cores, but I've never been able to hear one breathing again. I've never had an instance of complete silence, either. It's always noisy. There is so much wildlife here, and Coast Guard helicopters, and the pickup trucks of loggers, etc. I felt like there was something there, but I honestly couldn't see it. I did give it my best shot. The next few days, there were unusual helicopters and a really unusual airplane. In 1994, I lived in a remote cabin nestled in the hills of Bella Vista, California, not far from Redding and Lake Chasta. The surrounding woods were home to countless mysteries, and strange occurrences were not uncommon. One evening, I had some guests staying at my cabin. My friend and his wife were outside enjoying the fresh air when they suddenly burst through the door, exclaiming, You have to come out and see this. I was used to odd things happening around my cabin, so I reluctantly followed them outside, wondering what new oddity awaited me. We stepped off the deck and into the yard, and my friend pointed to the sky above the cabin roof. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Directly above us, there were baseball-sized flashes of blue electricity lighting up the sky. It looked as if more than 25 cameras were going off at once, creating a stunning yet eerie display. The flashes were completely silent, adding to the sense of otherworldliness. I tried to estimate how long the phenomenon had been going on, considering the time it took for my friend and his wife to notice the lights, come inside to get me, and for us to return outside. It must have been at least three minutes of continuous flashing. We stood there, mesmerized by the display, unsure of what was causing it or what it meant. As abruptly as the lights had started, they vanished, leaving us in darkness and silence once more. We spent the rest of the evening discussing possible explanations, ranging from natural phenomena to extraterrestrial encounters. I lived in that cabin for several more years, but I never experienced the mysterious flashes of blue electricity again. It became one of the many enigmas that made my time in the hills of Bella Vista both thrilling and unforgettable. Though I never discovered the cause of those strange lights, they served as a reminder that there is still so much in this world that we have yet to understand.
I was a cop for 27 years, which kind of brings me to what I experienced last year in Barrett's, Montana. As a cop, I approach things with open-minded cynicism. In other words, I like evidence. I want to see it, touch it, feel it, test it, and then make my decision. I retired from the department three years ago. I'm from northern Arizona. I decided I needed a second career. I taught school for a semester and really didn't like it. On a fluke, my best friend and competitive shooting buddy said, let's go to truck driving school, so we did. We drove as a team and spent all of last winter in the mountain states, running from Phoenix, Arizona, near where I live, to Shelby, Montana. We used to overnight in Barrett's, Montana, at a Sinclair station with a cafe, a small store, and parking for about 20 cents. It was a regular stop for us, so I was familiar with the area. We stopped this night, and I was in the driver's seat. My buddy was sitting on the lower bunk in the sleeper. We had a movie on the DVD player, and I was paying half attention to that, and half attention to my laptop when I caught some movement past the driver's window. Bear in mind, this is a small facility, and it is 100 yards from the freeway, but generally surrounded by a large field with three to four foot tall grass and thicket that goes right into foothills and mountains. I looked in the mirror and saw the biggest presumed man I had ever seen step behind my trailer, which was about 70 feet behind me. I said, Jesus, that's the biggest mirror I've ever seen. Damn. My buddy popped up and looked out the passenger mirror. It walked between the space between the rear of our trailer and a truck that was parked next to us. I didn't think any more of it for a while, but then realized that when I caught the movement next to me, the head of the guy was nearly at my shoulder level, which was ten feet off the ground. I was in my 2019 Freightliner Cascadia tractor. The bottom of the window line of my door is nine and a half feet from ground level. My cop brain went into assessment mode, and I thought it couldn't have been that tall. There must have been a shadow casting on my window. I wasn't even considering Sasquatch. I was tired and put it out of my mind. I finished up in my partner, and I went back to our bunks and killed the TV. The only noise is from my heater running. I fell into a very light sleep, which was unusual because I usually sleep like a baby. I'm totally comfortable in my truck, but not this night. It's like I felt like I was hovering between sleep and wakefulness. Around midnight, I really had to pee since the cafe was already closed by 9 p.m. I climbed out of the passenger side of my tractor. For some reason, I felt like I was being hunted or watched. Maybe not actively hunted like prey, but I definitely was aware of something predatory being aware of me. I've been hunted by criminals, and I've been around predatory animals, but I have never felt like this before. I finished quickly and looked around and scanned the grass field in the quarter moonlight and had a deep down feeling that I should not move toward the field. My instinct signaled that danger existed. I got back into the truck and locked the door. I felt like there was something out there that was dangerous, but only if I did something to trigger an aggressive response. I got back into my bunk and made sure that my Glock 10 pistol was in the cubby by my head. Being a retired police officer, I could legally carry in all 50 states, but I also made sure two spare magazines were close to hand as well. I tried to put it out of my mind and listen to a podcast while trying to go back to sleep. I slept a little bit, but I had a sense of foreboding. At 3 a.m., I bolted upright, reaching for my Glock. I saw it, whatever it was. Go by the front of the truck, this time in the space between the building and my truck. I moved out of my bunk to the passenger side window and only caught a faint and fading shadow moving into the darkness. Out of the faint glow of the low sodium, lighting on the building 75 yards away. There was no way I was going back to sleep. I got my coffee maker and started a pot of coffee and got dressed. I still had 90 minutes on my electronic log before I could go back on duty and drive us out of there. But all I wanted to do was leave ASAP. I kept looking up the windows of the truck, but I didn't see anything else. The sun started coming up, and with the light, the sense of foreboding retreated. I could see all around the truck and a few other trucks parked in the lot and out into the grass field and up to the building. My buddy asked why I was up so early. 
I told him what I'd felt all night, and he quietly said, Me too. When the sun was fully up, I walked all around the places where I'd seen it. I was using my cop brain again and realized that the hard-packed gravel would hold no tracks, especially as cold as it was. I walked to the edge of the grass field, and there was a trail. It was a game trail where I'm sure deer moved through. There were no large footprints visible. When the cafe opened for breakfast, my buddy and I went in to eat. We tried to figure out what we'd experienced and seen. I am firmly convinced that I saw a Sasquatch. I took the known and the unknown and the puzzle pieces and put them into one logical assumption that could be made. At any rate, we decided to put a day of driving between us and Barrett's and get to a larger truck stop or terminal. My name is Sam, and I've been a park ranger at the nearby Thompsonville National Park in Illinois for nearly a decade now. I've seen and experienced a lot in my years out in the wild, from the spectacular beauty of a sunrise over the mountains to the unexpected encounters with all sorts of wildlife, but nothing quite prepared me for the day I crossed paths with the enigmatic creature known as Bigfoot. It was a typical morning when I received a call from old Bill, a farmer who lived at the edge of the park. Bill had found some odd tracks on his property and wanted me to come take a look. Intrigued, I hopped into my ranger vehicle and drove over to Bill's farm. The tracks were indeed unusual. Enormous footprints with distinct toe imprints, much larger than any humans and deeper than any native animals could possibly make. I remembered some of the stories I'd heard around campfires and in whispered conversations, tales of a creature called Honey Bear, a nickname given due to its fondness for honey and its bear-like size. Some said it was just another term for Bigfoot. Curiosity peaked. I decided to delve deeper. For the next few weeks, I ventured out into the woods, camera in hand, on the trail of the mysterious Honey Bear. I found more tracks, some broken branches high up in the trees, and once even stumbled upon a partially eaten honeycomb, discarded near a creek. One day, while I was inspecting some claw marks on a tree, I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. A low growl echoed around me. I turned slowly, and there, not ten feet away, was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. It was tall, with shaggy brown fur and a hulking form easily towering over me. I could barely breathe as I slowly lifted my camera, but just as I was about to snap a photo, the creature turned and disappeared into the forest with a speed that belied its size. All that was left was the rustling of leaves and a sense of awe. Whether or not what I saw was the legendary Bigfoot or the honey bear of local lore, I couldn't say for sure, but I can tell you this. There's more to the wilderness than we know, and sometimes the mysteries are what make it truly magical. This happened to me a few years back. I live in a suburban neighborhood that borders a large park, part of which is public, and the rest is a closed-off reservoir. The public section of the park is sprawling over several acres. There are hiking trails in the woods, a baseball field, basketball and tennis courts, and a playground area. The park is accessible by car via a winding one-lane road that goes through the playground area and around to more remote sections in the woods. Eventually, this road leads out to a major busy highway. At one point, it was used as a cut-through to get from the highway to my neighborhood and beyond, Nowadays, there are several much larger access points to the neighborhood, and the cut through is seldom used. My story begins on a late winter afternoon. I was spending the day at home with my now ex-husband, who was an avid runner. He decided to go out on foot into the park to take a run down the one-lane road. He did this often, and the crime rate in this area is extremely low, so I thought nothing of it. After about an hour or so, he comes back all sweaty. I asked him how the run went and his time per mile, etc. He tells me he was slower than usual that day and just wasn't feeling very well during the run. As he's heading to the shower to rinse off, he casually says, 
Oh, I heard this dog whimpering in the woods when I was running. I am a bleeding heart for wounded animals and asked him for more specifics. He said he had not gone to look for the whimpering dog because the noise had stopped shortly after it started. He then said the last thing we need is another pet and went off to shower. I sat there for a bit looking at my three dogs laying on the floor and lazily pawing at each other. After a few moments, I couldn't stand it anymore, so I laced up some tennis shoes, grabbed some treats, and headed to my car. My husband was just getting out of the shower by then, and I told him I was going to look for the dog. He said I was crazy, but didn't try to stop me. Nor did he want to go back out with me. By now, daylight was fast fading, and it was close to 5.30 p.m. The spot he'd heard the whimpering was about two minutes from our house. I drove over and pulled my car into the shoulder so as not to block the lane. I got out and started calling for the dog here, Doggy, and other similar phrases to see if it'd start whimpering again or come out to greet me. I heard nothing, so after a minute or so, I decided to venture out into the woods. The woods in this area of the park are not too dense, with trees spaced at least eight, ten feet apart on average, and the forest floor was blanketed with fallen leaves. Every step I made was a loud crunch. I'd stop, call out, and be still for a bit, and then slowly move further into the woods. I thought I could hear a dog whimper once or twice, but it always happened as I was calling out so I couldn't be sure. The further I walked, the less light there was, and the more dense the trees became. I had brought my cell phone, but this one didn't have a flashlight app at the time. I'd been out there walking, calling and stopping for about 20 minutes when I came upon a small clearing. I've always been fascinated by the occult, but all the stories I'd read did not prepare me for what I saw in that clearing. The first thing that caught my eye was this formation of sticks laid out on the ground. The sticks were all of the same size and formed a small circle. Inside the circle, there were three more sticks propped up in a tripod formation in the center. On top of the tripod was a small doll's head with the eyes missing from their sockets. I immediately had this O.F. moment where I realized that I was a woman alone in the woods at dusk, with no form of protection on me and in a spot where I clearly was not meant to be. I froze in place as I surveyed the surroundings. To make myself less scared, I called out again softly, this time, come here, puppy. There were small bones in a pile at the far edge of the clearing. A bush to my left had several more gouged-eyed dolls' heads hanging from the branches. It was not windy that day, but I swear I heard the rustling of leaves that last time I called out for the lost dog. As I scanned the perimeter from left to right, my eyes suddenly fixed for a split second across the clearing on something in the trees. There, about eight, ten feet back in the bushes, was a man's face. I kept my eyes moving because something told me not to let him know I'd seen him by staring or reacting in any way. The brief moment I glanced at him was enough to momentarily paralyze me. His hair was long and unkempt. His eyes were bulging almost as he stared at me. I couldn't see the rest of him because of the tree cover. At this point, my flight response finally kicked in, and I was able to move again. I remember saying something to the effect of silly dog must have found his way home as I started to back out of the clearing, still scanning. He didn't appear to be pursuing me, so as soon as I was half hidden by trees on my side, I took off running at full speed to my car. I couldn't tell how long it took, or how far it was, but daylight was all but gone by now. I somehow made it back to the road, a few yards behind where my car was parked. I sprinted to it and locked myself inside. It took me four attempts to get my key in the ignition with how badly my hands were trembling. I finally got the car started and beat it the hell out of there. Took the long way home to my house by going out to the main highway and entering my neighborhood through another well-traveled intersection. As soon as I was home, I called the police to report what I'd seen. They never followed up with me. The more I've thought on this over the years, I'm convinced that the man in the woods was the one whimpering to lure a gullible victim like me off the little road and into the woods.
My name is Tanya, and I am a teacher at a local school. One evening, after visiting a fellow teacher and friend, I began my journey home. To reach the bus stop, I had to traverse a forest track. Little did I know that this ordinary walk would soon become an extraordinary experience. As I made my way through the peaceful woods, a faint voice reached my ears. I halted my curiosity peaked, scanning my surroundings for the source of the call. And there, just a few steps away, stood a small humanoid figure. It was unlike anything I had ever encountered before. The creature wore a tight-fitting black overall, resembling a diver's suit. To my astonishment, it communicated with me telepathically. The being introduced itself as a traveler, akin to the astronauts or cosmonauts of our own world, having journeyed from a distant corner of space. It sought my advice, or perhaps my assistance. Despite the strangeness of the situation, I felt an overwhelming sense of calm and curiosity instead of fear. Compelled by intrigue, I agreed to accompany the enigmatic visitor to its spacecraft. Together we veered off the beaten path, venturing deeper into the dense pine forest, and then before me loomed a colossal silver object resembling a flattened egg, cowering like a medium-sized truck. It lacked wings or windows, its form defying conventional understanding. With a simple hand gesture from the alien, and an invisible hatch materialized, revealing an entrance into the craft. Stepping inside, I found myself in a cabin devoid of visible controls or mechanical instruments. The creature motioned for me to settle into a deep armchair, which felt strangely inflatable and unnatural. As I said, I scrutinized the alien more closely noticing the details that had escaped me earlier. Its hands possessed six fingers, a peculiar trait. Its expressionless face seemed almost doll-like, and its mouth moved out of sync with its speech, reminiscent of a puppet. The alien explained that the interaction between us held immense significance for both scientific understanding and the advancement of civilization, both on Earth and its own planet. Astonishingly, it proposed a most extraordinary proposition to engage in intimacy with the purpose of conception. It assured me of its unwavering commitment to care for me and our future child, offering assistance during critical times through imperceptible means. Months later, my child was born, evoking concerns among doctors due to his unique physical attributes. Yet these worries soon dissipated as he thrived and grew, appearing outwardly ordinary except for a few peculiarities. His eyes lacked lacrimal glands and his breathing became shallow during sleep. To ensure his well-being, I even secured a job at a nearby kindergarten to keep a watchful eye on him. In 1992, a local newspaper correspondent had the opportunity to meet the boy and hear his story. According to the journalist's account, when sunlight graced his eyes, they emitted a red glow akin to a Siamese cat with his pupils transforming into vertical slits. Remarkably, the boy possessed a mature countenance resembling that of a Lilliputian. During their extensive conversation lasting four hours, the boy revealed that, besides myself, the journalist was the first person he had confided in regarding his extraordinary origin. He spoke with confidence, saying, I am unafraid of our secret because my father will protect me from harm. I carry his knowledge and experience inherited even before my birth. In some aspects, I embody his individuality, not just in flesh and blood. The boy, however, declined to demonstrate his abilities, but hinted at changes within his own body, including temporary transparency. He expressed a desire to share his wisdom with those willing to help humanity, including the people of Russia, to navigate through challenging times. According to him, humanity stood on the precipice of an evolutionary leap, faced with a choice to embrace transformation or fade from the cosmos. He emphasized ecological concerns, the struggle to adapt to new technologies and overpopulation. Moreover, the boy proclaimed that all religions were essentially one and urged the inhabitants of Earth to renew their consciousness, akin to ancient mystics and prophets, becoming spiritually awakened individuals living in harmony with the divine laws. In the second phase of his experiment, 
he aspired to determine if the qualities of Earth's inhabitants could be inherited, much like his father's qualities. With positive changes occurring on Earth, the boy believed his father's planet and its civilization could eventually join forces with ours. The story of this extraordinary encounter continues to intrigue and challenge the bounds of our understanding. It serves as a reminder that the universe holds wonders beyond our comprehension, offering glimpses into a realm where the extraordinary and the ordinary coexist in fascinating harmony. I've never been much of a believer, still not, but I have no idea what could have caused this. For context, I'm staying alone in a super remote cabin. It is very old, and you can't walk around without the floors creaking. There is a small grave in the backyard, with the bodies of the people who originally built the place. One morning, I got woken up around 6.30 a.m. by loud banging noises. It sounded like a very drunk person stumbling around and sort of bouncing off the walls and fumbling with things. But the sound stayed in one spot. Weird description, I know. At first, I thought someone had broken in before, realizing the floors were not creaking. The sound went on for a few minutes, then slowing and returning, finally going away. I checked the whole house with nothing to be found. Later on, I looked in the attic for a possible animal and still nothing. You can't even stand over the spot the noises came from. Plus, it too loud for a small animal to make those noises. Lastly, I know it wasn't carbon monoxide or a waking dream deal, because I got some of the noises on video. It hasn't the loud ones, just a few small bumps, as I was more worried about the person I believed to be in the house, but it's still enough for me. So when I was 14, 15 years old, my parents owned a travel trailer. One of those you attached to the bumper of a truck. It had bunk beds in it, and I would sleep on the top. We went on a trip near Cloudcroft, and then during COVID, we went to get out of the house. On the third night, I remember getting up in the middle of the night. It was pitch black, because we were out in the mountains. When I peeked out of the curtain, I'd just see this figure in the dark, and the only thing I could see is its piercing white eyes looking at me. I lay back down trying to sleep again, but not long after do I hear scratching on the floor. I didn't get up. I felt a presence behind me as if it was just looking at me. I just remember crying to sleep that night. The next encounter I had with, I was in my own room. I was 16 at the time. It was around 12 a.m. to 1. I was just scrolling through my phone before bed. I turn off my phone, and after 15 minutes of trying to go to bed, I open my eyes and look at the foot of my bed, and it was just staring at me again. I put my head under my covers trying to get rid of it or to go away. It was just observing me. I could feel it eyes seeing, though me. My last encounter was also on a trip this time to San Antonio. It was night again. But this time, my parents bought a new fifth wheel trailer, and I had my own room with a door. I was staying up on my phone once again, but this one is different if couldn't get. And all I remember is that it was scratching at the door, trying to get in. After a while, I think it gave up and thankfully left. I haven't had an encounter since then, and hopefully I will never have to. So my dad and I were hiking back in late November 2005 in a place called the UBC Research Forest north of Pitt Meadows, British Columbia, Canada, about 30 miles east and a bit north of Vancouver. It's on the edge of the mountains with several logging roads and trails. Anyway, the day was already getting late when we headed out, and the weather was horrible. There was no wind, but there were showers, hail and slush. It was around 3 degrees Celsius. We were the only ones in the area hiking, and the parking lot was empty, both when we arrived and left. After about an hour of hiking randomly up logging roads and trails, we were a good several kilometers into the area when we took a break by a small stream and a small gully. Anyways, we smelled this horrible scent, sort of skunkish, with a human and fish scent mixed in. Neither of us had ever smelled anything like this before.
and we've both encountered every large animal there is out here on the coast. Because there was no wind, we knew it was close. We kept going along this hillside. Above us, fifty feet up, was an old, overgrown logging slash. Below us, a thickly wooded slope where we could see maybe a hundred feet down. We started feeling like we were being followed, and the forest became too silent. Even the local ravens didn't make a sound. We smelled the scent another two times, stronger each time, so we began hiking faster. As we came out of a small gully, we heard a crash. Spinning around, we raced back to the crest and looked back down. Something large and tall, easily taller than my dad, who was six foot, disappeared into the bush. We just caught a glimpse of dark brown. Since neither of us was armed, we continued on at full pace, knowing there was a logging road ahead. Again, we smelled that weird smell. We heard noises from the old logging meadow above us. Whatever it was, it was moving very silently, yet occasionally breaking a branch or bumping a small tree. I've been followed by bears and cats before, but neither moved like this. It was way too silent to be either. For the record, grizzlies aren't in this area, but I have encountered them before, too. After we rounded a bend in the slope, we heard movement again. This time it was on the lower side of us, or so it seemed. After another few minutes, we heard it again and smelled it. Now it was moving on the upper side of us, just over a low ridge, maybe a hundred feet away. By now we could see the logging road a hundred or two hundred feet ahead. Then this thing let out a cry that sent a shiver down my spine. My dad, whom I've never seen afraid before, except the one time I was near death, another story, went cold. It sounded like a cross between a whoop, a human, and something unknown. It lasted for about five seconds. We turned and ran to the road. Running down the road, we passed a junction and continued heading south. I dropped something a few seconds later, about two hundred feet past the junction. I stopped, turned, and picked it up. Up amongst the trees, something tall and dark ducked out of sight. I have no clue what it was, but it was tall and fairly slim. It was too dark to really tell what it was as it was getting close to dark, and so we ran back to the parking lot. Unfortunately, it snowed the next day, several inches, Otherwise, we would have gone back and searched for evidence of this occurrence. This to this day frustrates both of us. Nevertheless, this is the only time I have ever been scared in the woods.